It's time for a pure performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for pure performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. You know, last uh, in the last episode, everybody, uh, I might have given everybody a scare by announcing that Andy might have been abducted by Der Commissar. Um, and hopefully somebody caught the reference and tweeted in about that. But we're, you know, we record these ahead of time. But, you know, I, I actually flew over to Austria, um, went to Falco's house, and there I found Andy. So Andy's back. Hello, Andy. How are you? Hello. I need to listen to this episode. Obviously, I haven't heard it yet because <laughs> you've. It's not I aired it. So the commissar, there was a was that a hit too in the US, I believe so. Yeah, yeah there, was I know, but band, there was another band that did a, an English version of it. But then you yeah. had some of the cool radio stations playing the Falco version where you couldn't understand a word of it, but it you know, he had a really groovy video, uh, you know, nineteen yeah. eighties, um cocaine, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's a he's a legend in Austria still. Unfortunately he's no longer with us obviously, but uh yeah. No? Great stuff, great, great yeah, pop no, songs. But, no, but I'm, but I'm back. Yes, welcome back, Andy. Thank and you. we have a good show today, right? As always. I, I, I hope so. Yeah, I, I think we can already hear him a little bit in the background because he tried to find a quiet room and a headset. Hopefully, <laughs> he found a real quiet room. Uh, today with us is, is Brett, and I think Brett was with us once or twice mm -hmm. already. Brett, are you uh, once? Or, are you is the second or third time for you on the show? Uh, I think this is the second time. Yeah, I think it's second uh, as well. We've done many webinars, so it gets blurry. That's, that's true. <laughs> hey, hey, Brad, for those folks that don't know you, quick intro maybe what you do right now, and uh, then we obviously, you know, focus on stuff that, you know, I learned from you a couple of weeks ago when you were actually visiting Austria, and we were at the end of the week sitting at my balcony, and uh, we're talking about all sorts of things. And then I learned a lot of, about your previous professional life, which is why we brought you on the show today. But maybe let's get started with uh, who you are and what you do right now. And then we would dive into the topic. Sure. So, uh, as I said, Brett Hofer, and uh, I'm actually a managing um, practice manager for um, Dynatrace Services, uh, specifically targeting enterprise um, conversions. I used to do primarily just DevOps uh, engagements for working with our enterprise clients on how to, um, you know, build those kind of optimized pipelines. And it's really blossomed now more into a, a team of world architects where we're going to be primarily focused on that plus cloud native and uh, architectural guidance for our larger enterprise customers. That's cool. And how, how long have you been with Dynatrace now? So I will have been with Dynatrace going on six years this November. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yes. and... Uh, and um, now when we when we sat down here in Austria, you were actually over for a workshop we did on on some of the uh, let's say use cases and and services we we are offering to our customers, mainly the larger enterprise customers. And without going into further details, we 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 sat down at the end of the week, as I said earlier, and then you started to explain. Uh, you know, what you did in your previous life, because I was interested in, even though we've known each other for a while, I guess we never really talked about a whole lot about our past. Yeah. And, and then I real, then you told me, and I guess you can just tell it much better. So you want to tell me what you did before Dynatrace and what time of projects you, you, you started and then you like the, the one big project that we want to more focus on, but let's get started. What did you do before Dynatrace? Yeah. So um, before Dynatrace, and I will say, uh, let's if we're focusing in on the the job that we were talking about prior to me joining, um, I was actually a, and and it was really around this whole monolithic uh, breaking down of the monolith, which is really you know. S made me think about this whole entire story because this is, was the granddaddy of monoliths. Um, I, I was the senior application manager uh, for all of WellPoint's customer service desktops nationwide. And um, that was really the project where I inherited, you know, almost three years worth of coding that had been done and had turned um, into 
a really tough business challenge for the, for the folks there. Um, and I was asked to step in and, and help fix this. And I quickly found out, uh, you know, how monolithic this application was. And so the story started to get written. <laughs> and that's really where I had to do a lot of, you know, the things that you talk about. And then uh, we went into obviously a lot more detail on, on some of the things I did to, to fix that. Mm -hmm. And now the, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure if everyone that listens knows WellPoint. Maybe you can give a little more context on, on, on what WellPoint has been doing or is doing now. Yep. So, so WellPoint was actually a conglomerate of 14 Blue Cross Blue Shields. It was the, it's basically the largest health insurer in the United States, uh, which is now Anthem. Um, and we were, uh, at least at the time when I was there, we were insure, insuring 35 million members. Uh, and the application was specifically for all of the customer service desktops nationwide to be rolled out to 8,000 of these desktops nationwide. So we had nurse care managers. Uh, we had, you know, three different divisions like commercial, personal lines and federal lines uh, where we basically had all these people who serviced people calling in, asking for claims. Do you cover this? People from the hospital, behavior health. I mean, you name it. This piece of software had to be what was sitting in front of the desktop for these folks while they were taking calls live. So performance was huge. Access to things were huge. Lots of changes constantly going on. Uh, but that's, uh, but, but WellPoint is still, or in, which is now Anthem, uh, is, is certainly a very well-known health insurer. And then, and then you said, so the, there was already a project underway for about two to three years. And, uh, and, and, and why, and, Kind of what was the goal of that and how did it change and why, why did it, you know, get to a point where they had to call for help? Yeah. So, so what, what happened was it was, uh, they actually, the funny part was the three years was the call for help in the very beginning. Uh, and they had a very large, uh, firm come in and help them build this application. Um, and I think it was almost as though this firm did not realize the, the size of the magnitude of the challenge. And it, you know, it was all done in Java, J2EE, they used rational. Um, and because the way health insurance works, you have all these different back end lines, you know, you have your memberships, you have your products, you have your plans that they sell to these different companies. Um, you have the claim systems, you have hooks into RX or pharmacy. Um, and then of course you have every different type of customer from the corporate to the federal employment, uh, the federal employees to just regular personal personal managers or who are personal people who just have those. And when you have such a huge challenge and all these requirements, they were essentially trying to start from scratch and build the ultimate, you know, servicing application for, uh, for the company. And, uh, but I don't think it ever made it to the architects in understanding how big this thing would get. So over two to three years, uh, you know, they didn't really create modules out of this. It was just built one big war file that just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, they would have their modules for each one of those different types of components that I explained. Mm -hmm. And they, and, and so in this service company, they, so they, came in, built everything from scratch, but what about the existing system back then? So nothing nothing was reused, they never thought about and like slowly building something new on top and then reusing some of the existing services through APIs or any any background that you are still from you know memorizing on how that yeah, works? Yeah, no, uh, no, because actually it was handled by numerous different applications by the by the service. So this was a completely new thought of just creating one unified desktop that that managed everything and then could track calls from the beginning to the end it had different types of telecom hooks so that when a call came in you know mm -hmm. it would answer and give them notifications and be proactive so there was it was definitely a kind of a bleeding edge business thought um which sparked this innovation uh and plus remember as i mentioned it was a conglomerate so wellpoint had just finished acquiring 14 different blue cross blue shields so which one were they going to pick? They needed something yeah. to unify. So yeah, that makes sense. Can I so, can I just butt in here for one second because I'm listening to this and I'm a little bit fascinated and I, I I heard it in the beginning, but as I'm hearing the story, I realized I didn't retain it. 
you started with Dynatrace six years ago. So this was, what, like eight years ago you were doing this? Yes. Yeah, so this was, I was with WellPoint for right. uh, five Okay, so just putting that in perspective when we're talking about breaking up monolith, that's the reason I wanted to bring this up is this is well before that big trend started occurring. So that just kind of impressed me there and I wanted to reconfirm that point there. Yeah, and actually they thought they were breaking up the monolith, but back then it was about the service. It was right. Everything was SOA architectures, right? So right. everything was – well, we would break it up by federating, like funneling everybody through a big, huge enterprise service bus. And then the back ends in their mind, the access to the back ends was the breaking of it up, but they didn't realize there was so much consumption on the front end that the front end has to mirror all that data. So they didn't think about breaking down all those into separate components from a front end perspective. So, and then they, they, so after two and a half years, when, when they then called you, and I think we, we should later on also maybe go a little back why they called you, because obviously you already had a good reputation within the company for a different project you did there. But when they called you in after two and a half years, what was the status? Why, why did they think you know, they need help from somebody else? Yeah. So, well, so I had, as you mentioned, I had prior to being, you know, put into that position, um, I had been charged with converting all of the customer services uh, or, or the telecom, the 800 numbers. These were 800 numbers that actually called into the desktops that were used. Believe it or not, they had over 15,000 of them. And I was asked over a two and a half year period or two year period to convert from one carrier to the other carrier to get one unified carrier for all their 800 numbers. So I had a very big familiarity with the landscape, the call patterns, you know, all of the different uh, divisions I had. Um, you know, I had a lot of uh, political connections and networking connections throughout that. So because I knew that landscape so well, and I knew applications really well, it's what kind of put me into the spot uh, to assist on this. Um and that's when I, you know, sat down in a meeting and when it, when it happened, uh, I went through some very, very, uh, aggressive steps to finding out, you know, where we were, how many people we had on, how was it structured and how were we going to fix it? So, so what, what was the status quo that you were presented with and how did you, I mean, what, what were the things you found out? So what I have found out is primarily this – what created this as a monolith is the fact that because for over two and a half years, they had been continuously building on this war file would continue to get larger. Uh, all of the screens for accessing, let's say, claims or the membership information or the plan information, all these different things were just being piled further and further into the system. And, you know, the interesting thing about enterprise projects that are this big is uh, as an app manager, you're, you're really faced with uh, the project request, as you can imagine. Remember, I had mentioned that there's really three major lines. There's commercial lines, there's personal lines, and then there was federal lines. And each one of those were represented by different stakeholders from the business. And so you would get requested changes like, oh, we need this specific information carried for federal people, or we need this information you know, tracked for our commercial customers or our personal customers. So these would all come in as project requests with funding and everything else, and then the, the Funding would come in, and now as the app manager, you are given a set of resources that have to all manage this and get what needs to be done collected, tallied up, and then delivered within a quarter. And you had to make the quarterly releases because everything else in the enterprise was being released on that quarter. So you had to go in and you had to finish um, so, so this is, these were some of the big things. And so as this thing grew, you know, build times became very important. The amount of automation and testing became very important, but also because of all that pressure, the developers only concentrated primarily on the next quarter of their release. 
Meanwhile, your technical debt is just piling up. And so we were finding things like, you know, 100,000 exceptions or errors every five minutes were accumulating um, in the logs. And, you know, one issue would just kept boiling up and then that would go into the next release and into the next release. And pretty soon, the only thing they're concentrating on was the new functionality and everything else. So the issues list just kept building. So I, mm. I kind of walked into a big, big nest of, of issues. Issues. And so, you stayed. So the, <laughs> stayed yeah. Just doing my job. Yeah. And so, so to reiterate, if, if I hear this correctly, uh, that means because of the quarterly pressure of delivering based on the budget that was giving and based on the promise on the features that should be delivered within the quarter, obviously the engineering teams focused on delivering the new features, probably then cutting on writing automated tests cutting on doing probably performance tests, cutting down on, as you said, uh, you know, analyzing the log files and getting rid of exceptions and stuff like that. And that over, over quarters and quarters, and then over the course of two and a half years, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that piles up just because at the end of the quarter, somebody wants to deliver and has to deliver a promised feature. And yeah. uh, so it's just, yeah. Well, well, I know maybe maybe a little bit more to that. Even it's not so much the development team at that point was like, let's say, the automated testing. See, we had many different departments representing, and we had silos, and we had you know throw this over the wall. So what would happen is, let's say, for example, automated testing. It's not that the developers were bogged down in the automated testing. The problem was trying to keep the communication going between a monolithic app and its changes, and telling the automated testers what they were going to have to automate because the the code was changing so rapidly and they'd have to wait for it to be deployed into a deploy uh, an environment before they could actually run their automated tests so just manage it i mean I, they were you know these are budgets of you know 10 million a year 20 million a year i mean a, the very big budget so you could throw as many as an app manager at the time you could throw as many bodies as you wanted you know at it they were just like just get it done but you can't manage that you know the size of it was just getting uh, out of control because it was one big monolithic app and you know three hour build times uh, everything it, it was tough were they taking shortcuts on some of the testing and all too, or was that all at least getting? Done? Well, uh, well, you know, when I got there, you know, this is all what what did I witness once I came on <laughs> on the ground? Uh, th this is what I was faced with when I when I stepped into the role, yeah. um, and it was basically we need you to help fix it. Um, so that's, but, but as Andy was asking is that that's really what I ran into. That's, that's the role I stepped in. In fact, I had a staff of almost 70 people onshore, offshore at the time I stepped in the role. Right. Um, yeah. So be, 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 before, you know, telling us what you did, why did you take that job? <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, because I had won three awards on, on the last job I did and the, the VP at the time, uh, <laughs> And I'll put a shout out to Denver Wall Brown. He knows me. Uh, he said, I know you like challenges. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was my yeah. VP at the time. Yeah. There, there you go. Cool. So then what, what did you do? Okay, so uh, when I first got on, what I ended up doing is, is he said, hey, this is my VP, he said, he said uh, you got your development staff, they're in Virginia, Richmond. I said, oh, well, it looks like I'm going to spend a lot of time in Richmond. Uh, so that was the primary uh, group. I was in Connecticut at the time. So I flew down to Richmond, Virginia, and I gathered the entire room of all the lead engineers for the various components, and I put them in a room. And I think I shocked them a little bit because uh, originally the my predecessor had not necessarily nearly as much technical knowledge. I, I have a very deep coding background and uh, I brought them all into a room and I sat them down and I said, OK, we're going to do code reviews. And I, and I don't think that they they thought that was going to happen. So um, rule number one, when you get into somebody to fix it, like a, a senior app manager, product manager, um, make sure they're extremely technical, especially if you're trying to fix a problem, because that's the way we, we say you take the smoke out of the cockpit. Um, and I literally went around the room with the lead problems that our, our people were facing and that were being reported in the issues list. And I tackled them one 
one at a time, having them show me the components, how they were tied together, the dependencies, how they architected it, um, how the screens were being done. And I, I literally brainstormed. I had flown people also in from around the country to that session for that one month to build an ultimate strategy on how we were going to fix this. Um, and, and once, once I had established that the next thing you do is I decided to go on a, uh, a national tour and visit some of our largest call centers where these, uh, customer service reps were, were taking phone calls and we had, and I made my team, including the business analysts and the development staff, uh, the, the folks that were doing some of the design work, sit down and listen to the agents all day and watch them move through the screens, watch them get frustrated, watch them on the various things that they were running into, take complete notes and then draft that back. And then we would formulate from a usability perspective and a, and a priority perspective, what are the number one things we could fix for our users so we could slow down the pace of, of, you know, abrasion is what they called it. Um, call abrasion because i mean at the time you know wellpoint and the entire teams both development and it and business were really really important of making sure that the customers were happy so mm -hmm. so basically letting this this is obviously something that we now would expect anyway to happen in a software project that you actually understand your end users that you have somebody that represents a an end user in your in your team that actually can speak for, hey, this is what we need, this is what doesn't work right now, but you actually flew them into the different locations, let them sit next to them and experience firsthand on, on what their frustration is. And now, did they, in this particular time or at this time, they already, you already rolled out the new system that was built for the last two and a half years, or was it still the old, the, the previous system that was supposed to be oh, replaced? Oh, no, this, this, no, this was the new one. I mean, it new had one, been yeah. rolled out in, in uh, strategic areas. Yeah, um, okay. So, but before they could do further adoption, of course, yeah. It, yeah, there's nothing more emotionally impactful than, you know, instead of sitting and seeing a metric go off on the screen saying, hey, you've got some frustrated users, um, yeah. although that's, that's super helpful you know, going forward, because you can't obviously visit people all the time. But when you're trying to fix a system, it's much mm -hmm. more impactful to watch it firsthand, especially if you're the one supposed to be designing the system. So yeah, exactly. that's why I have to say, I mean, I, I obviously I love the fact that you can sit physically next to somebody. Uh, it's not always possible, but that's why I think advances in our RAM technology with uh, this, the, the session replay um, that we that we're building right now. Yes. Um, I think that's going to be obviously a big, a big help here uh, because it shows you how people are, you know, getting stressed with uh, moving the mouse around. Or I think as Simon always says, rage clicking and rage scrolling, and and you know, obviously. Um, that's going to help a lot in the, with oh, the feedback. Oh, loop. absolutely. I mean, and we were doing that type of stuff, but the difference why I think our stuff is going to be so incredibly powerful is the fact that it has context. I mean, yeah. one of the toughest part was establishing context of the call with the data. So, mm -hmm. so we're, we're, we'll be able to actually tie the problems to the session, but that yeah. was a huge piece to it. Uh, I'm I'm curious um, when you're going around having all these meetings, pulling everybody together. You mentioned that you had these quarter re quarterly releases, and it was kind of full throttle to that release. How did you manage to take time enough away from people to get this done? Like, how was that handled? Right, because obviously, uh, in many cases, you'll have someone say, "All right, we're going to slow down some of the releases," or there's you know, in modern terms of monolith to microservice. A lot of times protections are built in and teams are given the leeway, but it doesn't sound from the setup that you gave that there was spare time to do that. Or if you did do some discovery, how are you even going to start implementing something? So how was that time situation handled? Yeah, so so there's really two pieces to it. There's the actual fixing the problem, and then there was the assessing the problem. The assessing the problem was probably about a two-week tour. I was only using my lead uh, engineers. They weren't necessarily doing the coding every day. They okay. were doing the, more of the leadership uh, pieces, brought some BAs and some business sponsors um, because obviously, you know, it's also uh, – 
you know, the software development between IT and business is a very big relationship thing, even internally with an enterprise. And so, you know, we formed some bonds. So we, it was also long days. I mean, we were still yeah. on calls trying to handle QA calls and things that were going on the next release. But the team members that I put together were primarily not the coders. Okay. Uh, it, it was more the lead. Cool. So and the, uh, the, the means you you stabilized, you started to obviously, you know, put out a lot of fires where fires had to be, you know, put out. And, and did you then manage to take the system and then fix it well enough to roll it out to the rest of the different departments and locations? Or did you then chose a different approach. So so the approach became there was there was two coordinated pieces. There was number one, we had to the, so the 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 enterprise service bus believe it or not uh, was because it was still in its uh, growing stages had not been fully versioned, uh, which made the quarterly releases very difficult because you know once we weren't the only consumers of that enterprise service bus. So there was there was fixes going on with other teams that were outside of my control. Um, but from our perspective, we did some very, very strategic things. Number one, after doing all of those assessments, we've identified how to break the monolith, meaning we were going to break it down into separate service components that could all be built independently, uh, which required quite a bit of object-based um, re-architecture uh, and, and dependency changes, uh, you know, dynamic loading of dependencies. There was a lot of architectural changes that need to happen so that in Instead of having to build this one big war file, we could build and break everything out by their individual modules from the membership modules to the claims modules to the product and plan modules. All, all that stuff could be built in their own separate pipelines. Uh, now, certainly, as you noticed or as you mentioned, you can't be doing that at the same time as you're trying to have the same team do the changes that must be done for the next quarter. Um, and so I had to stomp for number one, a full blown design up front that we sold to upper management and asked for a certain amount of money and started an entirely parallel team that all that team was responsible for was the completely new branch and new deployment methods and new everything uh, that would be running in parallel. And they would have to work with merges and, and take in new changes that were happening in the quarter. But ultimately, I had to create a completely independent parallel team that, that worked off of uh, in parallel with, uh, with the mainstream team. How, and how, how big was the team? How much, grant, how much money did you get? How much funding did you get? And how big was the team? So it was it was a four point three million dollar ask for the fix um, for the fix path because we instead of going off of the master root branch we would separate that into separate build branches and separate pipelines. But uh, I believe the the funny thing is even though I had a seventy person team I really only constructed I think we had about eight to ten guys that were the fix team or basically the new architecture team. Um, and, you know, it was almost like we said, build a hello world for a completely new type of pipeline. I mean, we used things like Maven. We broke things into Maven and we had uh, a lot of things that strategies that that team used that was independent of what was being done in the main thing. But they had the they were empowered to make whatever changes that they needed to, to make happen. Uh, and, and that was really the only way it was able to work keeping two two audiences happy <laughs> yeah so but did you did you say so this this team of of eight they had to keep uh an eye on the main branch on the on the current system that was out there and all the code changes that went into the quarterly release and they were responsible for taking these code changes and also putting them over to the new to the new architecture is, is this what yep. i hear yep 
that's 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 what they did. Um, and, and the way they did that was, you know, they could they could leverage resources that were being used. You know, a lot of the classes they could still, you know, a lot of the class they could still reuse. It was more of a decoupling yeah. um, logic that they and and the way they we structured some of the objects, uh, the abstracts and the macros and things like that. We, they created an engine that would allow us to do do things like break those things down uh, rather than statically have static dependencies and things like that so so it was not obviously and i i guess i got this wrong in the beginning i thought it was more like a copy paste exercise but that's not what it is because <laughs> no. they both being obviously not smart we're going to start a new project by copying and pasting it all and adding <laughs> some stack overflow copy and paste as well exactly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The other thing that was really important, too, is uh, and, and they actually I, we had them do it on the main line rather than just the, the separated line was what we, what we considered calling quieting a system. Um, so, you know, although we would go and I see this a lot in, in, in companies and enterprises I go to, as me, especially in the larger applications where they're just spewing out tons of exceptions and thousands and thousands of things. And people don't realize that, especially as you get later on and you want AI and you want to baseline things, um, it's very difficult to isolate issues in a pipeline when the pipeline's spewing hundreds of thousands of exceptions all the time. And so I made right out of the gate the first thing, even, even just the normal development team, I asked them to quiet the system, to go down from 100,000 exceptions and log errors down to like, you know, we're talking 90 or maybe 100. Um, and bring those numbers down. And when they did, what happens is all your metrics start to you know level out and, and really start to quiet so that when something does happen in the pipeline, somebody would introduce a new change or a new problem uh, and check in a new issue, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, but you will be amazed at how many systems out there are what I would consider noisy and people don't realize how important it is to quiet those systems. Yeah, because otherwise you will never really find the anomaly because if the whole system basically is behaving abnormal, then you never really find – yeah. That makes That's more common than, than, than you think, believe it or not. Yeah. I, th yeah. I think the record I was seeing in an old uh, client we, I used to work with, I went in on a proof of concept and they were running about 14,000 exceptions a minute. And I said, well, yeah. here's a problem. They're like, well, we know about all those. I'm like, but, yep. <laughs> but this can't be good for the system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and Brad, how did you acquire, what was your approach of quieting? That means really people had to look into these exceptions and figure out why they are thrown and then and fix the root cause or is quieting the system more that uh, they, you know, sh you shall not, you shall not lock those that are, um, you know, not essential to the log files and therefore they don't make it into, they don't make the noise or yeah, what, 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 it, it, it was a combination of things. Well, some of it was just rudimentary. I mean, it was basically, okay, sort count on the number. Like uh, if I, if you take all your exceptions list and you sort count it and you said, okay, I can knock off 30,000 of those right out of the gate because they all lead back to a specific path and stop ignoring it hit it, then boom, you just knocked out 30,000 of them. Uh, logs, very similar way. Um, either it, you know, I've seen many times where people would log something and they would just flag it as an error, but it wasn't really even an error, but it had rippling effects by marking it an error. Um, so yeah, turn it into info, turn it into warn and let us dial it down. Um, and then of course the other noises were things like, and, and I would, I would tally all this stuff up as technical debt. Uh, right. So, I mean, the, the more logs, exceptions, slow DBs, uh, HTTP errors, um, you know, in your web requests, all th those things tally up what equates to technical debt. And when you add it all up, if your numbers are that high, then you got a lot of technical debt. And people as an app manager, you should put that on the forefront of reduction, like even as high as some of your stuff with your um, – you know, as your features or functions that you're delivering. And the reason for that is because many times buried in those, in that technical debt or cascading issues that are feeding, you know, QA issues and problems out in the system and manifesting themselves in different ways. Um, and I found 
that exercise to be incredible because as we're trying to build a new line that works better, um, I, I can't be seeing all of this other noise going on. Uh, and, and it really helps me identify when something else is introduced that's a problem. Yeah, I think we should come up with something like a health indicator because basically what you're explaining is if you are operating on an unhealthy app, then everything you do and if the – let's say the immune system of this app is not is not good and then you, 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 you add something on top of it, you don't even know if the – if what you put on top can actually be handled by the underlying system because it's Absolutely. something like a, like a health indicator and it seems there's a couple of metrics that you just brought up, right? I mean, where approaches like quiet in the system, the number of logs, the number of exceptions. I mean, these are all indicators of how healthy an application is or a system is, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And then you'll get them also from the UI too. So it's 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 not just app server level. If you get JScript errors or crashes, you know, yeah. you could you can build a a list that that defines that. And I think it it what I'm saying is the moral of that story is people need to stop ignoring it. Like if you're told as an app manager you need to your system's got all kinds of issues treat those as just as important as the functions that are going out for the next release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So quiet in the system. What else? Any Anything else you did um, afterwards? Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that we did a lot was tracking traceability. So, you know, one of the one of the most important things about uh, a system is somebody comes up with an idea and they want to and, and, you know, Agile is great in, in tracking uh, and making sure that that change uh, happens. But uh, people don't realize how important that traceability is. Who who entered this idea? Where at what stages has it gone through? If it runs into problem, how? How do I get that problem back to that person? So uh, the whole traceability route was a huge piece to it as well. Um, we worked on a lot of things about when a function went in and it was requested by a particular project team. Um, they we had values on it, and I'm not talking about just SLA metrics, but you know if we had a change going in, that change dollar amount could be like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you know, and uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollar change we should have more um, eyes on it, more tests on it, more um, things that we follow and we feed back not only to the developers but to the business as to how effective that change is as it goes through the pipeline. So we worked a lot on the whole traceability piece of entering in, documenting what the user story was and then going uh, and going through and having accountability uh, for it. So that was another very big thing. Yeah, and I think this is also where I remember when we were sitting on the balcony, uh, we talked about tracing back the also the business success or how does this feature or whatever the requirement was, how does it actually behave? How is it accepted? How, how much does it cost? And this is where I think we talked about the yes. um, feeding these metrics, for instance, back from that from a tool like Dynatrace into your into your Jira or whatever you use for your requirements management, and then actually seeing. You know, what's the adoption of that feature? How long did it take until it was adopted? Um, and uh, that's kind of closing the feedback loop back to the business and also to the developers, obviously. Right? Oh, huge. Yeah. yeah. I, that's why I was I was so excited. I told you I was like, I was so excited when I, you showed that slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like when, when I always tell you, I, I look at your podcast and when you and I, we converse even on, on some of the, the material we both use. And then I was like, oh, I was so excited when I saw that. <laughs> More, more so from my past. <laughs> I, was, yeah, yeah. I was like, where was that in my past? <laughs> yeah. so. so so with all that, uh, I assume the whole project was a success in the end? Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, it, it, the, the story continued onward because it was at that point in time. Um, and, and I won't mention the names uh, of uh, the the. The company that was sold. Uh, so, so just as this was happening, uh, WellPoint had sold into a massive account, and one of the requirements for this application was to go uh, 80% video interactions with the nurse care agents. 
Uh, and so that presented a whole battery of new new challenges. You know, do you record? Do nurse care agents go on a on a video screen? Some didn't want to be video, so they had to create new positions, new logistics on the cubicles. Uh, we had to figure out how are we going to get video in on the customer service desktop so that they could converse. You know, back at that time, and it was right at that time where I was I was part of a, a, a team that was engineering all the solutions around that coming up with the dollar amounts trying to procure and you know i think at that point in time i was like i think i'm i'm a little bit burnt out from all the challenges here <laughs> <laughs> and uh it just so happened dynatrace was right around that time uh asking if i was interested and they found me on linkedin uh and so the story i would have to leave to my the person who <laughs> followed me um uh, you know as to how you know where everything ended up but i did win i, I did win an award i was uh you know the, the it was very successful the breaking down of the monolith we had new build paths i was thanked by numerous uh there was a reorg with the new even the new reorg vice presidents and stuff uh so yes in my from my perspective and when i left it it was in a very successful state um did you uh can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, you mentioned when you took over the project, the build times of the big monolith was about two to three hours. What was what what was the metric uh, in your you know broken system? Well, not broken, but broken up system into the individual pieces. What were your you remember the average yeah, build time? Yeah, yeah, I I think we actually got them down to 35 minutes um, mm -hmm. because uh, essentially we had just the primary, uh, the primary framework had to get built. And then, um, all of the individual modules like claims membership and those pieces that were broken out could actually be built in parallel. Uh, I think overall CPU processing time was very similar, but because we were able to create those pipelines to run in parallel, uh, and those build modules to run in parallel, we were able to compress that down to about 35 minutes. Cool. And did and did you stick with Java, or did you uh, did your teams pull in any new technologies? Um, yeah, we stuck with we we did definitely stuck with Java. We had to because really we were just abstracting pieces to do the decoupling, you know, to do the decoupling, and we had to continue to leverage the code that was still being built, like the the screen resources and things like that. We were still leveraging a lot of that uh, a lot of that code. We weren't like rebuilding screens. We were actually the engineering part uh, marvels were in how to decouple it while still maintaining the primary code base, like the business business functionality and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Which is which is also a great testimonial because I think there's some certain stigmas out there that, you know, the big monolithic apps come from the Java people or the .NET people. But obviously if you are if you're architecturing it right with any technology stack, you can either build a bad monolith or you can build something that actually is, you know, is architecturally more sound and, and scales and you can break it into individual components and then test and build it independently. So it's not the technology stack that immediately gets you on the path of towards a monolith or not, but it's, uh, it's really what you do with the technology. I think that's just, I mean, it should be common sense, but it's, it's great to hear it here again. Well, and it, it's also, I think the key was, I, you know, I had some really, really great people on that team, very, very sharp, smart Java people on that team. And, you know, to consolidate them into their own and empower them to do it is is what made that even more successful. They they weren't in the everyday, you know, battles uh, with with change. They were chartered with, you know, hey, engineer something that will basically accomplish the following. And, you know, and that's that was their life. And that's what they needed to concentrate on was the decoupling piece. Um, yeah, and I think if you think about it that way too, a lot of organizations struggle with finding the time to make these massive projects. But if you take a stepped approach like you're talking about where, okay, we'll keep our language the same, we'll just set up some decoupling, that then will make this easier to maintain, which would then possibly free up some resources to start working on phase two, which might be, okay, maybe we can do this more efficiently with a different language or a different framework. But taking a stepped approach instead of an all-in-one, because I can imagine if you tried to do a whole new framework, a whole new language, all that at the same time, it'd be much more difficult. 
Yep. No, and the, and those discussions did happen. I mean, there were numerous, you know, people stomping to change out specific technologies, but you know, we had to, we had a, we had, we had the money, the budget that we had, but we also had all these other challenges like bringing down the technical debt, making sure that we still could meet quarterly, uh, you know, quarterly releases. I mean, the new fix team did not need to make the quarterly releases. We weren't releasing the broken down piece until the final stages where we felt comfortable. It was would operate as a broken down uh, architecture. Um, so, so they weren't on the same delivery schedule. Um, but yes, they, we did talk about that. And I, I was always trying to make sure we weren't take biting. We we're already biting off enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Hey, and I got one last question here. So breaking the monolith or finding these um, these breakpoints or seams or whatever you want to call them, uh, how did you how did you go about it? Did you was this just uh, domain knowledge of the engineers that told you where they think it makes most sense to break uh, the the big monolith into pieces? Did you use some tooling? Did you do some trial and error? How did that work? Well, a lot of it came down to uh, proper use of like Maven builds and dependencies. And then from a re-architecture perspective, instead of trying to statically link or, or bring things into these Java libraries, where if you bring one in and it brings a whole bunch of other things in, uh, we found breakpoints where we could do load library, you know, where we were basically dynamically loading, especially on resources and screens and things like that, rather than baking and making sure all those resources got into this one big war file, breaking all those resources out, putting them into their own builds. Uh, and then as soon as we did that, we'd see cross dependencies occur and then they would solve those cross dependencies. Like how would we break that cross dependency? Um, so, so, so it, it really, when you design the broken model, you break the monolith, you design your desired state, and then you go back into the code base and you find out all the places where there's these tentacles that are connecting and then you solution those one by one. And it's almost like once you solution one or two of them, then you use the same methodologies on, on some of the other ones. Um, and, and then the build techniques were different because instead of having this big massive build where you had to think of all the dependencies and download them, getting a lot smarter with Maven, Maven profiles and things like that, we, we, we did. Cool. Wow, and now you know that many years later. Well, thanks for, thanks for making the move over to our team to Dynatra. It's been six years, and you, as as you mentioned in the beginning, you're now leading the global practice team. And uh, I think you know having somebody on on our team on our side with that experience, with walking through this particular process of taking an enterprise software stack that obviously had big issues and couldn't deliver to the business needs, breaking it apart, uh, making it, you know, putting it on pipelines, um, you know, automating it and having somebody, I think on the global practice team, like what you are leading here, um, you know, hopefully gives a lot of our customers confidence that it's not only a great product that we sell, but also we have a lot of people that actually know how to uh, advise our customers on, on, on how to use our product in their process and how we can, we can obviously help them, you know, getting them to where they need to be. And I think that's, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, I'm really glad that we could chat, uh, a couple of weeks back on the balcony because I otherwise I guess I'm not sure when I would have found out what you've done in your life. Uh, yeah, I think I think we were a few glasses of wine deep too at the time. So <laughs> I, would say, I would say a few bottles. <laughs> okay, maybe you're there, you're right. I lost track. <laughs> yeah. well, but this was phenomenal. And thank no, and and, and, you. I, and I love this position as well. I mean, I've I've I love the company. I love the position because I get to actually get exposed not only to now one company, but I get the I get the uh, you know the opportunity to see this at the largest scales for different ways on people and how they approach it. So, um, you know, it's very, very good for, for me as well. And I appreciate all the opportunity I get here. Perfect. Cool. Brian. Yes. Yes. I think you kind of summarized already. Come on, do it.
Yeah, no, I think so too. I mean, but just just quickly, uh, yes. uh, Brad, as you probably know, we always do a little summary in the end. I think just a very high level what I learned or what I would what I would like people to take away uh, from this talk is if you are taking over a software project that is you know, obviously walking and uh, running in the wrong direction, there a couple of things that we learned today. First of all quieting a system you have to quiet a system in terms of the logs and the exceptions because only if you can quiet the system down you actually get rid of all the noise and you can actually see any regressions that individual new changes bring i also like the fact that you sat down in the beginning did code reviews with individual teams you obviously came in with a lot of technical skills that your predecessor didn't uh, have as much and therefore you also showed that you know a different wind is blowing now and we have to really take this seriously I also like the fact that you took uh, parts of your team, flew them around the country, set them next to your, the end users and really learned firsthand on where they're struggling. Uh, that obviously is the best way to uh, get you know, close to feedback loop to the engineering team on what to do next with the product and how to make it better. And uh, then the last thing is you know, obviously you don't want to just rip and replace, but what you really did is building a um, – a parallel team that was focusing on breaking the monolith and decoupling, reusing obviously the same code uh, because you don't want to rebuild everything and recode it, the whole functionality. But having it running side by side and then at some point in time make the decision on when it's ready for prime time and then uh, you know, obviously replacing the old system. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it obviously also helped that you had a great reputation. That's why people trusted you. And, uh, I think that's it. That's the summary from my side. Very good, Andy. The two things that I learned, and I think these are important ones is, um, number one, when Brett was talking about the budgets, I now understand it a little bit why beyond the regular costs, but why health insurance is so much. <laughs> and number two, if you're ever placing bets on Brett for a challenge, if somebody bets that he will not eat a mouthful of wasabi, I will bet that he will. But if they bet that he will not eat a mouthful of wasabi with a chaser of razor blades and lemon juice, I will vote against that because he, he knows when to when it gets too crazy but but you like the challenges so if someone ever gets into one of those i dare you to eat that things i think i have a better idea which side to bet on yeah <laughs> you would win <laughs> so uh but no thank you for so much for sharing the story it was awesome any any final thoughts that you had about all this anything you wanted to make sure people took away from this no, I think you guys did an awesome, awesome summary. I think I think my one addition is how important it is to, uh, and I see this a lot, to put a very, very good leader in with a, with a big, strong vision and willing to lead that vision in charge of these size projects, and then making sure you empower and trust them. Because the, you know, although I had those uh, the the position I did, I, I give a lot of credit to the directors and the VPs that I worked with, the business folks that I worked with that empowered me to make those changes, um, and and just went with what I had asked. Um, um, and so that is so important from a top-down perspective to, to breaking a monolith and building solid pipelines. I second that. We need leaders, not managers. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for being on, Brett. Andy, thank you for getting this one set up and welcome back. Hopefully uh, you weren't thank too you. Um, put out by being locked up before. But, um, <laughs> if anybody has any questions or comments, you can uh, contact us at pure underscore DT on Twitter, or you can send an old fashioned email at pureperformance at dynatrace.com. Uh, I'd love to hear any ideas. If you want to be a guest of the show and you have things that you want to talk about, let us know and maybe we can get you on. Um, anything else from anybody or is, is it time to say I do? I think it's time to say good night on my side. Yes. Yep. Thank right. you guys for having me on. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Bye-bye.